Welcome, everyone. Good morning, I should say. Good morning. There we go. That's better. All right. I changed things up, and you guys were lost. We'd like to welcome everyone here this morning. If you're visiting with us, a very special welcome, and uh, we hope you enjoy your time with us. Those that are online as well, I uh, pray that you're blessed by listening today. Um, things look a little different up here this morning. As you can see, there's a few more of us, and uh, we are joined together this morning, and we pray that as we go through the service that you will be blessed, God will speak to your hearts, and you will go away from this refreshed and ready to face the rest of the week. We uh, Let's just open with a word of prayer. Father God, I just come before you, and I thank you for your wonderful love. I thank you that you are a great God, worthy of praise. I thank you that you've blessed us today with this beautiful morning. Spring is such a, a wonderful time of the year when we look at renewal and refreshment. And we thank you for that reminder this morning. Father, we just uh, we thank you now for the Lord Jesus. We thank you that our Savior lives. We thank you that we can praise him this morning for the work that he has done on the cross. And as we sing these songs, lift our hearts in worship, we pray. Help us to see the words that are there to remind us of the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. And help us to praise him this morning. We pray for our brothers and sisters around the world, those that are being persecuted, those that have to meet in secret. And we pray that you strengthen them this morning. Wrap your arms around them. Show them how much you love them. And how much you love us as well. For those that are hurting. For those that are struggling. For those that are in need. We pray that you let them see that you care. That you love them more than life. That you sacrifice your son for them. And uh, that would encourage them this morning. Thank you for your love. Pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. To God be the glory. I think we'll stand as we sing this if you're able. To God be the glory. Great things he has done. So loved he the world.
song is called Desert Song. This is my prayer in the desert when all that's within me feels dry. This is my prayer in my hunger and need. My God is the God who provides. This is my prayer in the desert when all that's within me feels dry. This is my prayer in my hunger and need. My God is the God who provides. This is my prayer in the fire, in weakness or trial or pain. There is a faith room that more work and go, so we find me, Lord, through the flame. I will bring praise, I will bring praise, no weapon formed against me shall remain. I will rejoice, I will declare, God is my victory. This is my prayer in the battle, when triumph is still on its way. I am a conqueror and co-heir with Christ, so firm on this promise I'll stand. I will bring praise, I will bring praise, no weapon formed against me shall remain. I will rejoice, I will declare. God is my victory and he is here. All of my life, in every season, you are still God. I have a reason to sing. I have a reason to worship. All of my life, in every season, you are still God. I have a reason to sing, I have a reason to worship. All of my life, in every season, you are still God. I have a reason to sing, I have a reason to worship. I will bring praise, I will bring praise. No weapon formed against me shall remain. I will rejoice, I will declare, God is my victory and he is me. This is my prayer in the harvest, when favor and providence flow. I know I'm filled to be emptied again. The seed I've received, I will sow. So this is a, a new piece that we're going to do this morning. We hope you enjoy it. It's uh, It's got a great message. Um, it's fairly quick, so as you're learning it and stuff, uh, we'll try and carry you through it, but uh, you may be seated for this one, and uh, just listen to the words and uh, hear what the message is. Word creation suddenly articulate with a thousand tongues to lift one cry. Then from north to south and east to west, we hear Christ, we magnify. Were the From rivers to the mountain tops, we hear Christ be magnified. Oh, Christ be magnified. 
Let his praise arise. Christ be magnified in me. Oh, Christ be magnified from the altar of my life. Christ be magnified in me. Every creature finds his inmost melody. Every human heart is made to cry. And in one enraptured hymn of praise, we'll sing Christ be magnified. Oh, Christ be magnified. Let his praise arise. Christ be magnified in me. Oh, Christ be magnified from the altar of my life. Christ be magnified in me. I won't bow down to idols, stand strong and worship you. brings transformation and I'll be crucified with you cause death is just a doorway to resurrection life if I join you in your sufferings I'll join you in the rise and when you return to glory on the angels and the saints my heart will still be seen and my song will be Isn't it awesome when you think about the fact that Christ can be magnified through me and you? Only a God can do that. Only our God can do that. I'm going to let Verdon lead into communion. Good thing I got Verdon here. He, he reminded me of one thing. We do have a few announcements this morning, and I'm going to do those now. <coughs> uh, just for those that don't know, after the service today, there is going to be a time of coffee, tea, and I think there's cold drinks, and maybe even some snacks over there as well. And you say, well, that's not new. Well, today it is. Because today we have a very special couple with us, Tim and Laurel. And Tim and Laurel are going to be, they will be here with us one more Sunday. But today we are celebrating the fact that they've been involved with this church for 27 years? Somewhere in that range? Okay. <laughs> a long time. A long time. Uh, they've been mar uh, missionaries. And uh, Alma has been uh, the church that they have tended to come to when they come home. And we have enjoyed their time with us. So we're going to celebrate them, and you'll have a chance to visit with them um, today and, uh, and uh, just celebrate the time that they've been here at Alma and in the field serving faithfully. <coughs> also announcements in your bulletin, 
there is a, uh, a, a Bible study that is starting up. Uh, Murph is leading. And uh, that is going to be a Bible study on grace. And it's kind of carrying on a little bit from the conference, but it'll be separate from the conference. So it's open to everybody. You do not have to have been to the conference to go to this Bible study. And it would be a wonderful time just learning about grace. So that is on Tuesday at 7, 7 o'clock, Murph? 7.30, my, my bad, 7.30. Tuesdays at 7.30. I also have a thank you note here. I will just read it as is. With appreciation, some lives are true reflections of God's love. <clears throat> Sending a prayer of thanks to God and a note of thanks to you. To our friends at Alma, we are so thankful for your prayers. Your prayers have helped comfort us during this time of need. We are encouraged by your continued support as we struggle through these challenges. Thank you for your generous gifts and other financial blessings that you have supported us with through this difficult time. It has truly made each day easier. Ashley is now at home, continuing to recover, but is having to return to the hospital three days a week for dialysis. We are hoping that this is temporary. Many thanks from your friends, Dwayne and Tammy. Thanks, Helen. And also, um, I'd like to uh, inform you as well, uh, Janet Johnson, not all of you would know her. It's been a little while since she's been physically here at the church, but she's a, a member of this church as well. And uh, she has just been, has just gone into palliative care in St. Mary's Hospital. And so uh, pray for her. I'm going to just say a prayer here in, in a second for her. But um, yeah, she's uh, gone into palliative care. Janet Johnson, be praying for her as you, as you think of her through the week. Father God, we just come before you. We thank you for your love, your care for us. We thank you for Tim and Laurel and their faithfulness over the years. Such a joy to see, such an encouragement to us. And we just ask that you give them a special blessing as they, as they celebrate retirement and, uh, and the changes in their lives as they head out west. Father God, we just... Uh, pray that you would bless them in their journey and in their new uh, start out there. Father, we also uh, thank you for Dwayne and Tammy and uh, that they're a part of us here. And we just pray for them now, encourage them, strengthen them, strengthen Ashley as, as she recuperates and, uh, and give her strength as she has to go to the hospital. We pray that that would come to an end, that her, uh, she would not need the dialysis for, for very long. We just pray for that. <clears throat> and Father, we think of Janet as well. We just pray that you would be with her as she's in the hospital. Comfort her. Give her peace, knowing that you're there, wrapping your arms around her. Father God, we just pray for the pain that she uh, suffers. Just ease that pain. And Father God, for all others that are part of this church body that we, we know about that are in pain and suffering and have health issues, just bless them this morning. Encourage them in some way, we pray. In Jesus' precious name, amen. This morning as we come to communion, I'd like us to consider one word. And that one word is what brings all of us here. <clears throat> the word is Jesus. Jesus means the Lord saves. And most of what I'm uh, going to mention here is coming from a book that I've referenced before, 100 Important Words of the Bible, written by Len Woods. So I don't know how much we think of this from day to day, but as we're here this morning, all of us need rescue. Have you, have I thought about that? And in this book, there were 40 things that were mentioned of what we need rescue from, and I'm not going to read all 40, but there's things like depression, guilt, impure motives, anger, envy, shame, pride, debt, Greed, 
worry, discouragement, selfishness, bitterness, and there's many more. When we stop and think about it, there's, the fact is there's not a day that goes by that you and I don't need some kind of saving. So enter Jesus. It was a common name in ancient Palestine, the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew name Joshua. Every time the name Jesus is spoken, whether yelled when people are angry or called when folks are in agony, it's a reminder that the world needs, that we need, rescue. Rescue from sin and all of its terrible consequences. And there's going to be a couple of verses up, and uh, Nathan, if you would, or Nathaniel, if you'd leave them up there. The Bible claims power in the name of Jesus. And there's a couple of examples. Acts 4.12, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. In Romans 10, verse 13, I've always loved this. Everyone, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. However, that doesn't mean that we turn his name into an incantation or what that means like casting a magic spell, like abracadabra. Jesus' power is experienced by people who call on him and trust him from their hearts, not by those who mindlessly say his name with their mouths. And an aside, a couple of years ago, a family was here with us on a Sunday morning from a war-torn country. We here in Canada don't know anything about this or what it's like. <coughs> this family was in this war-torn country. Bombs were dropping all around them, planes flying overhead. They're hearing the bombs coming. They were expecting to be hit momentarily. And mom called out, Jesus! The buildings all around them were destroyed and they were spared. <coughs> Jesus, the name that is above every name. A day is coming when people will finally stop using it as a swear word. Every mouth will acknowledge that he is Savior, Messiah, Lord. On reading the Gospels, one can see that Jesus saves all kinds of people from all sorts of things. And friend, no matter where you're at in life, Jesus is well able to deliver you. Do you believe it? If so, participate with us this morning in communion. Let's pray. Father God, what can we say but thank you? It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.
this bread, take this wine, now the simple may divine for any to receive. By your mercy we come to your table, by your grace you are making us faithful. Lord, we trial we will face, and none too lost to be saved, none too broken or ashamed, all are welcome in this place. By your mercy we come to your table, by your grace you are making us faithful. Lord, we remember you, and remembrance leads us to worship, and as we worship you, our worship leads to communion, we respond to your invitation, we remember So this time we're going to welcome Dale to come forward again and present what God has laid in his heart. And uh, Dale, uh, unlike Murph, you know, we've given you a little extra time here, but be done by 10 after, okay? Continue to bless you for being here with us today. I think we're live. We got it. All right, I hear myself. Yeah, the echo is back. That's good. Looking at your uh, bulletin, I realize you got a baseball team coming up. One of the things I miss about retirement is this time of year, I got to go outside and play football and baseball and soccer and do all those things I love to do. Don't get to do it as much anymore. So if I would lived a little closer, I don't know if you welcome 63-year-olds, but man, I'd love to. You might need a pinch runner for me, but I'd love to play. Um, and that's the, one of the beautiful things of spring, for sure. Uh, we are continuing our study uh, today entitled Recognizing Jesus. 
Uh, last week, I initiated this study, which focused on the history of the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, as recorded in Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. In this two-part series, the key question before us is, why do we fail to recognize Jesus on our journey? I suggested last week that we fail to recognize Jesus because of our disputes and our discouragement. And today we'll continue this study by realizing that we fail to recognize Jesus because of our dullness, which I'll explain in a moment, and our disengagement or our detachment, if you will, from communion. If you have a Bible with you, please turn to Luke chapter 24. We'll read verses 25 through 35 this morning. And again, the Lord Jesus Christ had been crucified. Uh, He had risen again. These two disciples were walking seven miles from Jerusalem to Emmaus, and they were discussing. We learned last week they were maybe even arguing. Uh, They had this emotional conversation around the facts that just took place concerning this person named Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus appeared to them, and they didn't recognize him. Perhaps they were too caught up in the emotion of the moment as they were debating the issues and, and discussing it, we'll say, together. And picking up that narrative, Jesus says this in verse 25, and he said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going uh, further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over, so he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. The Lord will bless to us that reading of his word today. Let's pray. Father, we want to be so careful as we open your word and consider it together that we Uh, Look to you and invite into our lives, our minds, our hearts, the Holy Spirit to guide us, to teach us, to illuminate us, Lord. You know what each need is uh, this morning, and we pray that those needs will be met through the Word of God. We will be careful to give you all the praise and the glory, and thank you for this opportunity to gather together in this way. Bless our time together. Continue to bless our time together. Thanking you for all who have participated in the service so far. We're praying for the Sunday School, praying for each young person who's here. Each teacher, Father, guide us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So there are times in our lives, just if you weren't here last week, where we fail to recognize Jesus, like these two on the road to Emmaus failed to recognize him for a bunch of reasons. And there's a number of reasons. But from the passage we learned last week, first of all, we may fail to recognize him because of disputes going on in our lives. We're kind of busy, focused on Uh, what we disagree about, and we might get into arguments and conflict, and and we fail to recognize Jesus in those situations. We also read from our passage last week that these two were very discouraged, and and sometimes discouragement can interfere with our ability to focus and recognize Jesus. We're just focused on our issues, on the concerns, on the sources of our problems, and we fail to recognize Jesus. As we read further in our passage, we learn that we fail to recognize Jesus in our lives because of dullness and because of disengagement or detachment from community. Notice verses 25, 26, and 27. The Lord accuses these two of spiritual dullness. He said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things that enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them, what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Doing some homework this week, I learned that the word slow, as it appears in verse 25, actually means dull. (laughs) How foolish you are and how slow or how dull you are. Jesus questioned the spiritual acuteness, if you will, of these disciples 
And he asked out loud, well, out loud why they were so spiritually dull and so slow to believe. This condition is not specific to those two on the road to Emmaus. It's something that I'm sure the Lord looks into my life and into my heart and into my mind on a daily basis and says, Dale, why are you so dull? <laughs> why are you not picking up when I'm putting down? Why are you unable to see and recognize me working in your life, speaking to you in your life, guiding you in your life? Dale, you're so dull, right? Well, what's the cause of spiritual dullness? Again, a lot of reasons for that. A lot of reasons for that in my life. But the reason that Jesus goes on to articulate here is the lack of knowledge and understanding of the Scriptures. Again, notice what we read. Jesus said, Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in, underline this, notice this, highlight this in your Bible. He explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. All the scriptures. Not a favorite verse. Not a favorite book of the Bible, but he explained to them what was found in all the scriptures concerning himself. You see, sometimes my dullness is because I don't have a great understanding of all the scriptures. Sometimes, and some groups of people actually just focus and don't obviously this is a great focus i'm using a bible this morning that has red print in it those represent the words of jesus <laughs> some only highlight and focus on the words of jesus that's great obviously some just focus on the gospels some dabble into what paul was talking about in in, in the letters the epistles the concerns he had for the churches some even go as far as to try and figure out revelation <laughs> And some even fewer, it seems, pay attention to the what I like to call the Older Testament. Not the Old, because that suggests it is invalid. No, no, it's the Older Testament historically. And I don't know where your focus is. I don't know what you kind of like to read. I don't know what you gravitate to when you pick up this book. As a preacher for 35 years, I have a bookshelf full of binders of messages that are organized from Genesis to Revelation. And I have to admit, there's like 10 binders from the New Testament. <laughs> there's like three or four in the Old. That kind of confronted me as I was thinking about this. As I was studying this week, I'm looking at that shelf going, man, there's been a lot of attention paid, to the new, which it should be. Don't get me wrong. But boy, if we are not paying attention to the Older Testament, to the history, to the prophecy, to the poetry, to the wit, we are missing out. Jesus said to these people, man, you, these two, you're dull. Like, like, like you're slow to believe because you are not familiar with some of the scriptures. Didn't say that. <laughs> you're not familiar with all the scriptures. As our knowledge and understanding of all the scriptures increases, friends, so does our ability to recognize the presence of the Lord in our lives and in this world as a whole. Rather than being spiritually dull and unaware, our ability to recognize the Lord and hear his voice becomes so much clearer. My father-in-law, I've mentioned a bunch of times, he, he died a number of years ago. And he was a surgeon. He was brilliant. So I can't compare myself to him. <laughs> You know, Dahl Dale doesn't quite compare to somebody with what I would call the closest thing to photographic memory I've ever seen. Like, he was unbelievable. He was telling me the poems he, he one, one day, he, the poems that he created in his mind to remember the nerves of the face, right, which is really intricate. Not only could he still, this was when he was in his 70s and retired, not only could he tell me what those nerves were, he could tell me the poem he taught himself in university to remember the names of those nerves. 
We would be up the cottage. He'd pick up a 700-page book, and he'd sit there and just do this. And he'd read the book. An hour later, he finished. He closed the book. I said, come on. Don't tell me you read the book. I didn't read every word, Dale. Well, okay, tell me what it's about. I get all this detail. Are you kidding me? It didn't just apply to novels and history, which he loved to read. It applied to this book. I called him one night. I was a kid. I was in my 20s, and I was speaking somewhere. And I was given Isaiah. I'm making this up because I can't remember what chapter it was. It wasn't 53 or 4. It was like Isaiah 27. And I called him up, and I said, Gramps, we called him Gramps. I'm struggling to understand what's going on in Isaiah 27. Oh, the chapter... He quotes the chapter on the phone to me. That legacy has stuck with me. And so many other people that I've been exposed to, the Lord has been so gracious to to challenge me by those examples. Dale, why are you so dull, man? (laughs) Well... Maybe it's because I don't have a grasp of all of the scriptures like I'm encouraged to do. Last year in our study of Peter's denial of the Lord in Luke 23, remember? Remember? <laughs> we turned our attention for a few moments to Psalm chapter 1. You've got to follow me here. Because there we read this in Psalm 1, verse 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. You see, another cause of spiritual dullness is worldliness. And when we're too close to or too interwined with the world, we become spiritually insensitive and dull. We talked about a progression in Psalm 1. Do you remember it? Walk, stand, sit. Do you remember that? Because, see, that's a progression that I recognize in my own life. And the psalmist says, happy or blessed is the person that doesn't do that. That doesn't walk in the way, in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of scoffers. All right? It's good counsel sometimes to encourage one another to keep on walking. (laughs) The moment we stop and stand and kind of take it in a little bit longer. It can lead to us sitting down and becoming pretty comfortable with something we shouldn't be. That's what happened in Peter's life back in a chapter in Luke 23. We won't go through the details, but you may recall the Lord has been arrested. He's being taken away, and we read that Peter what? He was walking with the crowd, and then he stood with them around the fire, and then he sat down, it says, with those who mocked his Lord. You know him? No. I think you're one. No, 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 no. You're one of those. I don't even know that guy. You see the progression? How do we avoid the progression? Well, it's back to the point we're talking about here. Because the second verse in Psalm chapter 1 says this. Happy... Blessed is the person that doesn't watch and sit, but their delight is in the law of the Lord, and on His law they meditate day and night. (laughs) You see that? It comes back to knowing the Scriptures. Not just reading the Scriptures. It doesn't say blessed are those who take a couple minutes every morning and, and read a couple of verses. No, 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 it says, blessed are those, happy is the person whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law they meditate day and night. In my study at home, I have a large, wide-margin Bible. I don't carry it with me on Sundays because it weighs like 10 pounds, right? But this is a strategy I use. You may find it helpful, you may not. Some of you have better minds than I do. Some of you haven't been concussed as many times as I have. So I need to write it down. So in this wide margin, whenever I learn something, I write it down beside the verse that that comes from, or from what somebody has taught me, or or something that's been shared with me. 
So I have it there. I have a record of it. I can remember it. And besides Psalm chapter 1, verse 2, I have three quotes. <laughs> One of them was shared by Max Licato. The other two, I don't know where they came from. But Max says this, The Bible is not a newspaper to be skimmed, but rather a mind to be quarried. See the difference? Somebody else said, They usually thrive best who meditate most. <laughs> and somebody else said, Reading produces breadth, Study produces depth. How are you doing with your daily meditation of Scripture? How are you doing with getting a grasp and understanding all of the Scriptures? I fail to recognize the Lord speaking to me on my journey because at times I don't spend quality time seeking to learn more about Him than His truth. And as a result, fail to recognize him and hear his voice speaking to me. You need an illustration. The new minister was asked to teach a boys' class in the absence of the regular teacher. He decided to see what they knew, so he asked, Who knocked down the walls of Jericho? All the boys denied having done it, and the preacher was appalled by their ignorance. At the next a leaders meeting, he told about the experience. Not one of them knows who knocked down the walls of Jericho, he lamented. The group was silent until finally one seasoned veteran of dispute spoke up. Preacher, this appears to be bothering you an awful lot, but I've known all those boys since they were born, and they're good boys. If they say they didn't do it, I believe them. Let's just take some money out of the repair budget and fix those walls and get on with it. <laughs> you know, I read that, and I came across it years ago. That's kind of funny, but it's not. You can laugh. Don't get me. It's funny, but it's not. Dale, why are you so dull? I told you. It's right here, but you haven't read it. Or maybe you've read it, but you haven't really studied it. And you certainly aren't meditating on it. Meditating it. Meditation, by the way, I don't know if we talked about this. That's not the world's deal of, hmm, empty my mind. No, no, no. Meditation from a scriptural point of view is not, hmm, empty my mind. You know, it's fill my mind with scripture. It's not emptying my mind. It's filling it with the truths of scripture. Happy, blessed is the person that does that, the psalmist says. If you want to not kind of do the walk, stop, stand, sit thing, then fill your mind with Scripture and meditate on it. Think about it. Are we very casual with Scripture or are we intentional? Coming to it each day, seeking to hear the Lord's voice speak to us and asking the Lord to reveal Himself more and more to us. Again, do we just quickly get through a brief reading as we hustle out the door in the morning? Or do we try and set some time aside to, to quietly block out all the distractions, turn off the TV, turn off the phone. Like I'm amazed, to, I'm amazed to watch young people study. You know, earphones on, TV on, laptop on, and there's a textbook open. Seriously? <laughs> no, we want to we, we wanna shut out all that stuff. And I'm not saying, you're, you're, I understand as a preacher, I thank the Lord, I was saying to John that, or I appreciate the opportunity to be here and to prepare something. Because if I wasn't doing that, I wouldn't be spending the time I spend. I'm telling you, Dahl Dale wouldn't be doing it. He'd be watching more football, playing more golf, maybe playing a little baseball, maybe folks here at home, whatever, right? That's what I would gravitate to. And when I had downtime, the TV would be on, I'd be watching something on TSN or whatever, Right? No, 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 no. Dull Dale, I'm going to ask you to preach. And it's going to force you to get in the Word of God, and I'm so grateful for that. I've recently been reading through the, the, uh, the Old Testament, because <laughs> I've been challenged by that. So I just continually read through the Bible as a devotional reading before I sort of get into preparing whatever the week's message is going to be, wherever I'm going. And one of the things that stood out to me, I just finished actually this morning reading uh, Ecclesiastes, but, but up to that point, 
one of the thoughts that the big thoughts that I've taken from it is is, is seeing and recognizing the sovereignty of God. When you read through that history, you come to the life of Joseph. Are you kidding me? How that the details of his life? I did five week study at some church on Joseph a little while ago. And it just impressed me again. I know we read the stories in Sunday school and all that wonderful stuff, but think about it, meditate on it. One minute he's thrown in a pit, his brothers can't stand, they hate him, they want to kill him, and he rises to this amazing position. Like all of that represents the sovereignty of God. It's amazing. Do you recognize God in the life of Joseph? What about Moses? Just did a study on Moses. Wow, you know, put the little guy in the basket and floating in the river. Who comes along? The details of that, it's incredible, right? And then I read Esther. What? There's another amazing piece of history where we see the sovereignty of God. God's hand at work. In the lives of these people, and and we're so grateful that the Old Testament records and tells us about them. Why? Because when I, Dal Dale, when he recognized what was going on in the lives of Joseph and Moses and Esther and all the rest of these amazing people, you know what? I recognize God anew in my own life, in the life of our family. And it's caused me to have some conversation with my adult children about recognizing God's hand in their lives, encouraging them to see his hand in their life, to see Jesus. My son and his, my son's a physiotherapist, and he and his wife now own a a clinic, and and how that all came to pass is it's God's hands. And I've encouraged him, do you see the Lord working the details out? My son-in-law's brother, I've, I've shared with you before, and another partner, they, they have a business going that I'm a part of, sort of. <laughs> and, uh, and I just was talking to them a couple of weeks. Guys, just, let's just pause and see how this has come to pass. Yes, we see it in Joseph, we see it in Moses, we see it, we see it, we see, we see it in our own lives, don't we? Well, we do if we are staying close to the scriptures. When we do that, we recognize Jesus. The Holy Spirit applies the word of God to our hearts and our minds, and it's through this process that we first experience spiritual clarity and recognize Jesus as our Savior. Let's not stop there, let's keep going let's keep growing (laughs) i've shared with you i'm sure over the years i've quoted thomas terence and i came across him because he had some really interesting things to say i think it was maybe on wisdom when we did a study on wisdom a year or so ago here um he had some interesting things to say about wisdom from a scriptural point of view he's a scholar he's a phd he was the director of the c.s lewis foundation right so Institute. So this, this, is a, this is a shooter when it comes to, uh, to scholars. I had no idea about this guy's past. And I read this. As a high school student in the 1960s, Tom Terrence was seduced by extremist ideology and radicalized during the social upheaval of the era. Before long, he became involved in the reign of terror spread by Mississippi's dreaded white knights of the Ku Klux Klan, described by the FBI as the most violent right-wing terrorist organization in America. He had been shot multiple times and arrested by police after an attempt to bomb the home of a Jewish leader in Meridian, Mississippi. Tom was sentenced to 30 years in the Mississippi State Penitentiary. After recovering from near-fatal wounds, Terrence and two other inmates escaped. An FBI SWAT team tracked them down, killing one of them, and Tom spent the next three years alone in a six-foot-by-nine-foot cell. (laughs) Tom began a search for truth that led him to the Bible and a reading of the Gospels resulting in his conversion to Christianity and liberation from racial hate and violence. I'm quoting this guy as a scholar. Maybe you've heard of him, right? Not having a clue that this guy recognized Jesus when reading this book 
in a cell. And oh, the Lord started to do a work in his life. And he got out of that cell. He got out of that penitentiary. He went on to become a scholar and the director of the C.S. Lewis Institute. Are you kidding me? No, I'm not kidding you because that's our God. Do you recognize him in your own life? Do I recognize him in mine? I need to, I need to hurry. Because <laughs> i got one more point to talk about. At times in our lives, we fail to recognize Jesus because of disunity, discouragement, and dullness. But also because... At times, we may disengage or detach from communion. So let me just remind you again of what we read in verses 30 to 35 of Luke 24 as we come back to our passage. When he was at the table with them, so, so these, these are walking to Emmaus. They, they get home. Jesus looks like he's going to keep walking, but they invite him in. In verse 30, when he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they, what? There's our key word recognized him and he disappeared from their sight they asked each other were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us they got up and returned at once to jerusalem and then we get down that they tell the others about him and they tell how jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread the reenactment of Jesus breaking the bread was key to the disciples recognizing Jesus, and this is central to us recognizing him in our daily walk, as we've done this morning, right? And as we do each week here at Alma, um, most churches I go to do, some don't, some it's monthly, some it's at a different time of day, whatever the beautiful thing is, the New Testament doesn't give a whole lot of detail about communion, it just says do it. Just says, do it. Jesus asked us to do it. Some churches don't do it. Don't do it very often. I love coming here because my week starts with what? Worshiping the Lord together with a wonderful group of people and sharing communion. Why is it important? Oh, that's the anchor, friends. The bread symbolizing his body that was broken for me. The, the cup representing his blood that was shed for me. It takes me back to the very foundation of our salvation. And I don't know about you, but, but this is a reminder I need every week. I need to begin my week thinking about the sacrifice that was made for me. I need to recognize, acknowledge, and praise the Lord each week for what he has done for me. In his book titled The Gospel According to Jesus, Chris Say shares the following story. One week I was preaching in our church about the kingdom that is coming, and on the way out a young man grabbed me, and he said, Pastor, the kingdom of God is already here. Every Sunday night, I just he's telling his past to this pastor, every Sunday night I used to be in the same neighborhood. I used to come down here to a bar called Emo's. And I'd start every night with a drop of ecstasy on my tongue and wash it down with Bacardi 151. <laughs> That's what I did Sunday night after Sunday night after Sunday night. Now I come to a worship service instead. And I finish the evening with the bread representing the body of Christ on my tongue. And I wash it down with the wine symbolizing the blood of Christ, pastor, the kingdom of God is here <laughs> just as much as that addict needed transformation and needed to recognize jesus and replace what he was doing with communion every night every sunday night would have changed that wasn't his life i need to start every sunday every week with these emblems before us to remind me of what jesus has done for me i recognize him in the bread i recognize him in the wine and if we detach ourselves from that friends we're missing out and dale can become even more dull than he already is i'm sure these disciples on the road to emmaus were humbled by the lord's teaching and instruction that he gave them and i'm sure and this is just my interpretation right 
But I'm sure as, as he interpreted all the scriptures to them, their anger at each other might have dissipated a little bit. And there might have been some kind of, ah, oh, look, I'm sorry. I got a little heated in that discussion. <laughs> and there may have been some sort of forgiveness offered between the two. With humble hearts, their eyes were open when Jesus broke bread, and our spiritual eyes are opened as well. When we consider each week through communion what Jesus did for a wicked sinner like me, we praise and worship him anew, and our differences with each other fade away, don't they? <laughs> if Jesus can forgive me, which that bread and that wine symbol, if he can forgive a wretch like me, why do I hang on to so much stuff with other people? Come on. Do you see why it's so significant in so many ways? We fail to recognize Jesus when we detach or disengage from communion. With that being said, physically being here every Sunday is so hugely important for a lot of reasons. One of them being the experience of communion. And if you're a Christian, I encourage you to participate in communion each week and re-recognize Jesus as your Lord and Savior and give thanks for all that he has done for you. Let me take you back to what we talked about in Luke chapter 22. I have notes to prove it. It's a little while ago. But there we read Jesus instituting this feast. This is my bread which was given for you, for you, for you, for me. This is the cup of the new covenant that was my blood that was shed for you, and you, and you, and you, and me. See? As Christians, it's important that we, we participate in communion when it is available to us. I just want to say a word before I close. We're so grateful for those who have tuned in online this morning. That's an amazing technology to think about it. When I was a kid, do I ever think that was possible? To think I could sit in my office and talk to a group of people in a church, right? This is, this is stuff like we would see on the Jetsons way back in the day. Young people don't have a clue what I'm talking about. Um, but it's an amazing technology, and we're so grateful for those who are skilled, of which I am not, to understand it, to make it available to us. We're so grateful for those people who are tuned in online this morning. And I don't know why you're tuned in online, right? There's a bunch of reasons why you are, and we're so grateful you're here with us. Could be illness. Could be a mobility problem. Could be you're out of town. Could be you just don't feel great today. Could be you have the sniffles, and we're so sensitive about the sniffles these days. I get it. Could be you, you just couldn't get a ride. That person that normally comes couldn't come. Whatever. I don't know. But we're so glad you've tuned in. But let me also say this. I've read statistics saying that up to since COVID, 30% of people haven't come back to church. In some communities and congregations, apparently the stat is that high. So if you can physically be here, understand what I'm saying. I understand many of you can't. There's times when I haven't been able to. I haven't been able to go and preach. And I put on my computer, push a button. Whoa, I'm in church. There, there. That's incredible. Right? Whenever I get a cold or something, I always get laryngitis, and it's always Saturday night. What do you do? How do you scramble? What do I do? Who do I call? Okay, call somebody. They push a button. I push a button, and I can do it, right? We can make it happen. It's incredible. But if you can be here, be here. <laughs> Come. Paul said, I'm writing you this letter, but I'd rather be with you face to face. Church is about face to face in its ideal form, right? We need to see each other. We need to recognize and see what we're feeling when we're communicating with each other. We need each other. And if you're able to come, come. Let these wonderful people here at Elm encourage you as they encourage me and let you contribute something to their lives. And let me encourage you to come and participate in communion because that is something significant for sure. All right. Why do we fail to see Jesus on our journey? Studying Luke 24, 13 to 15, we realize that at times in our lives we fail to see Jesus because of disputes, discouragement, spiritual dullness, and detachment or disengagement from communion. Let's commit 
to abiding in Christ and appreciate his presence in our lives each and every day. I'm going to close with a testimony of a young man who, who I think I can do it, Alan. I think I can do it here. No, thank you, brother. You're too kind. I'm not back at the end of June, so no, I'm, that's okay. I'll, I'll, I'll finish in time. This is a story that comes from uh, Lee Strobel's book, the, uh, the Case for Grace. You're studying grace with Murph, which is fabulous. Um, and this is just a testimony of a young man who didn't recognize Jesus in the early years of his life. And I'd like to just to share this as a closer to encourage you as it's encouraged me. Early in life, Andrew began flirting with trouble to gain attention from the crowd that he wanted to impress. First, there was petty vandalism and other reckless behavior, like blowing up jugs of gasoline on highways at night to startle drivers, igniting Molotov cocktails in the schoolyard, and building bigger and more powerful pipe bombs. This, this little guy's got some issues here, right? <laughs> then came theft and drinking. With Andrew and his friends stealing beer from the garages and alcohol from the liquor cabinets of their neighbors, they would make jungle juice for their parties, a potent alcoholic concoction brewed in 30-gallon garbage cans. Pretty soon came marijuana. There was a period of time in high school when we'd smoke dope on the way to school at lunch, and then after school, Andrew said, we would party every chance we could get, usually at a house where parents were out of town. Lee asked him, did you ever get caught? Occasionally. Once in high school, we were drinking, and I crashed the car in someone's front yard, and we all took off. I got a ticket for hit-and-run driving, which was a felony, though later that got resolved. Usually, I would weasel my way out of trouble. I really hated it when I got caught. I did show remorse, but getting away with things made me even bolder the next time. After high school, Andrew went to conservative Biola University in Southern California. I relied so much on what others thought of me, and suddenly there I was at a new place where nobody knew me. I began asking, who am I really? But instead of digging deep, I reverted to what I knew, partying and drinking. He lasted a year until Biola invited him to seek success elsewhere. <laughs> nice way of saying it. He transferred to the University of Oregon in Eugene, a more liberal school, where he majored in English literature and dabbled in cocaine and hallucinated hallucinogenic drugs by then he says I was really out of control fast forward a few years by now Andrew was living in Boston starting on the bottom rung of the corporate ladder at a clothing retailer and living on a tight budget in a cramped apartment he remained as far from God as ever I found myself relying on alcohol and partying for different reasons he said I was using them to mask the reality of all the guilt and shame in my life I didn't like to go to bed sober because then I'd be haunted by memories of all the people I'd hurt or deceived or used. And there was anxiety, fear of the future, fear of the world, fear of eternity. Lee asked, how bad did things get? Emotionally, I was despondent, he replied. Fewer and fewer people were impressed by my antics. I was always partying, which was a little embarrassing for somebody my age. If I couldn't find anyone to go out drinking with me, I'd get drunk on beer and watch television until I fell asleep on the couch. When I'd wake up, the fuzz would be on the screen. Those were the days when stations would sign off early in the morning hours. I'd turn off the TV, go to bed. The alarm would go off. I'd get up, go to work, and repeat the cycle all over again. Did you ever think about spiritual matters? Andrew's eyes narrowed as he thought back. I was starting to wonder about eternity. Like, would my life someday just turn to fuzz like the TV, and that would be it? It was a demoralizing thought. When did you hit bottom? Lee asked. Some friends and I were out drinking and carousing one night. We got into a profane shouting match with a panhandler on a sidewalk. After a while, he lay down to sleep, and I can't believe we did this. We started kicking this guy repeatedly. He grimaced. I mean, how low can a person get? Kicking a homeless guy? Really, I'm ashamed even to tell this story. How did I descend to where I thought that was okay? Walk and sit <laughs> my pal but how did i descend to where i thought that was okay that was probably my lowest point andrew ended up going to jamaica one week and staying with a jamaican businessman and his family which included son chris and daughter wendy as andrew hung around with them and their friends he was amazed and intrigued by their fresh and enthusiastic faith which seemed to reflect the abundant life he had always heard his parents talk about 
They were fun and normal, warm and friendly, engaged with the community, and they were sold out to Jesus in a very winsome and radical way. Andrew recalled, Jesus seemed so real and present to them. These were young people who recognized Jesus. I was listening as they told others about how God had healed their addiction and restored their relationships. I was thinking, this is what I need. I can't keep pretending that my shame and guilt aren't dogging me. Something has got to happen. Well, that week in Jamaica, world-renowned evangelist Luis Palau was preaching at the Kingston National Stadium. 35,000 people every night filled this facility, which was next to the statue of famous reggae singer Bob Marley. <laughs> and Andrew was invited by his friends. Do you know who Luis Palau is? Maybe you don't. He was associated with Billy Graham for years. He translated in Spanish what Billy preached. He went on to become one of the world's greatest evangelists with his outreach festivals, books, radio programs, now having reached a billion people in 75 countries. That's who Andrew went to hear that night with his friends. And we read this. I always respected my dad and the sincerity of his message. This is Luis Palau's son, friends. On the last night of the crusade, I went with a receptive attitude. I really wanted to hear the voice of the God who had so completely changed the lives of these new friends of mine. And did you? Well, as I sat there and listened, it struck me that Dad's message was different than ever before. It was like he was picking on me. <laughs> he really went after me. Didn't even know I was there. <laughs> and then I realized this was the same message he always gives. He was talking about the story of the rich young ruler, only I wasn't rich and I ruled nothing. It had nothing to do with me, yet the Lord was pressing me. He was beginning to recognize the Lord, friends. When he gave the invitation to receive Christ, I found myself saying in my spirit, Lord, this is what I want. Please come into my life. I'm going in a new direction. I want heaven and I want to do the right thing. Everything I say I hate, but I can't stop doing. I want to stop doing it. Everything I say I want to do, but can't seem to do it. I want to do it. At that moment, I determined to stop drinking, breaking off, and I broke off inappropriate relationships, and I started going to church. The story ends with him marrying Wendy, the daughter in that group that he went with. And now for over 25 years, Dad passed away in 2021. He's become a leader in the Luis Palau Evangelist Campaign. He travels the world telling people the story. He went a long time without recognizing Jesus. But when he finally did, his life changed, and it changed forever. May that continue to be your experience. God bless you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for your love, your grace, your mercy. Thank you for all that you've done for us. We want to recognize you. We want to acknowledge you. We want to see you. We want to hear you. We want to become more like you. And we ask your special blessing upon each one who's gathered here this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Dill, for that message. How important it is that we recognize our God, that we recognize Jesus. The last song today is I Speak Jesus. We'll stand as we sing this.
Father God, we come before you. We thank you for your great love. We thank you that we can speak the name of Jesus. That we can sing of his name. We can sing of his love. And that he is present with us. We thank you for Jesus. We pray in his precious name. Amen. You are dismissed. One thing I do need to say. Don't forget the pictures in the back room. Melanie's asked me to remind you of that. If you are not signed up yet, please go anyways, and uh, we can get your pictures done today. Today is the last day, so please go back there.